Hi everyone, welcome to the Bad Women panel at The Strand. Tonight we'll be talking about bad women and many other exciting things like fiction and the patriarchy and sex and uh, what it's like to be an author in New York City and what it's like to be a wo woman in New York City. So I'm very excited, I'm here with Camille Perry, Naima Coaster, Naima Coaster um, Georgia Clark and Carla Lovering. Um, and before we start, I just want to get to know all of you. So can you raise your hand if you are a writer? Okay, can you raise your hand? I see some of my writer coworkers here. Um, can you raise your hand if you are a reader? And can you raise your hand if someone took you here against your will? All right, so there are a few of you. No, we will convert you to becoming either a reader or a writer by the end of this. Um, yeah, so there will be about 10 to 15 minutes of reader Q&A at the end of this, so start thinking of your questions now, uh, because I will be calling on you at the end of class. Um, <laughs> okay, so for my first question, um, tell me that well-deserved elevator pitch for each of your books, and also how it connects to our theme, Bad Women. And just to clarify, bad women does not necessarily mean bad people. Bad women are rebellious, transgressive, people who don't necessarily fit the mold of what a woman is supposed to be. And all of these books feature characters who are fighting themselves and by doing so, breaking the rules. So tell us what your books are about and also how your women break the rules. Uh, Carla, we can start with you. Okay, great. Hi guys. Um, so my name is Carola and I am the author of Tell Me Lies. Um, Tell Me Lies in a, an elevator pitch is a novel about a toxic relationship. It alternates perspectives between two people. So Lucy is the protagonist, and then Stephen is her love interest, who's kind of like the anti-hero of the novel. Um, and the novel spans about seven years of their on and off toxic relationship. Um, they are both originally from Long Island, from New York, but they meet during college in Southern California at their fictional college. And it's basically just about like that one relationship that kind of messes you up that I think a lot of us have experienced. Um, they keep going back to it even though they know it's unhealthy. And they're both hiding these dark secrets from their past, so it gives it a little bit of a thriller aspect. Um, but mainly it's a coming of age story. And Lucy, I mean, talking about bad women, Lucy keeps making mistakes. Like she keeps going back to a relationship that she knows is bad for her, that she knows is unhealthy. She ignores her friend's advice. She just does a lot that doesn't line up with her own moral compass. Um, and I think that that's you know, what, what makes her bad and what makes her flawed. Um, for the sake of the definition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but Steven is really the bad guy, guys. Steven like, is, in is comparison, worse, I mean, Lucy's like an angel, but. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, my name's Georgia. My uh, latest book, The Bucket List, came out last week, and it's about a young woman living here in New York who is diagnosed with the BRCA1 gene mutation. That's the breast cancer gene that puts her at a very high um, hereditary risk of developing breast cancer. So she has to make a decision, either surveillance or um, the more radical step of a preventative double mastectomy, and she's 25. So my book and main character, Lacey, falls into the definition of bad women, I think for two reasons. One's context and one's behavior. The context is the book discusses, pretty frankly and without apology, topic of a preventative mastectomy. And that's not something that we really talk about a lot. And I think that's ultimately because it makes people uncomfortable. It's something that is a very unsexy idea about a body part that is very much related to and defining the feminine, both as a sexual creature and as a mother, I mean, breasts. Uh, and I think that a mastectomy is something that is still very challenging for us to talk about. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. And the second thing I think is my character has a lot of sex. And it's not the kind of like fade to black sex, it's like sex sex. <laughs> and that's still something that a lot of readers find very confronting and don't like. 
And I think that's very interesting. Um, I will keep writing about sex because, I don't know, I like to annoy them. But like, uh, <laughs> and please people who like reading about sex. But I think it's really interesting to think about why do we feel so uncomfortable um, reading about sex, which is something that most of us do. And um, so that makes her a bad woman. Hi everyone, I'm Naima, I'm the author of Halsey Street, and my book is about a mother and a daughter who are trying to find their way back to each other in gentrifying Brooklyn and also in the Dominican Republic. So the daughter Penelope returns to Brooklyn to take care of her father, who's not doing so well after the closing of his beloved record store, and she rents a room from a new affluent white family in the neighborhood, the Harpers, and becomes enmeshed in their family life. And while she's living with them, her mother reaches out to her from the Dominican Republic, requesting that they reconcile. Um, and her mother's name is Mireya, and both of these women are bad women for different reasons. Penelope is someone who has a lot of anger about her own family life and the shifts in her neighborhood. She's got strong appetites for gin and for sex. Um, and she's also a character who's stuck and hasn't figured out how to live into her identity as a painter and as an artist. So she's not particularly high achieving, no gold stars for Penelope. Um, and then her mother is someone who abandoned the family because she found the roles of wife and mother to be too um, constrictive for her. Um, and that's something that her own daughter uh, really faults her for. Hey everybody, I am Camille Perry. My book is When Katie Met Cassidy. It is a romantic comedy about gender and sexuality that focuses on two women, Katie and Cassidy. Um, Katie is a born and bred, uh, she's born and raised in Kentucky. Um, she's a rule follower. She's someone who grew up in a fairly traditional household with a lot of religion. She's not someone who shakes, rock, rocks the boat. Um, She's someone who does care about being liked. And she's not someone who ever would have imagined she'd be someone who would fall in love with another woman, let alone a woman like Cassidy, who is the other female in the book. Uh, Cassidy is basically Katie's polar opposite. She is very masculine presenting. She is out and proud, born and bred New Yorker, um, very promiscuous. Cassidy never met a rule that she didn't break. Um, and so, to bring these two characters together, um, there's a lot working against them. And one of the things that's really working against them is that Katie um, is essentially a very traditional girl who's going to do a very not traditional thing um, with a very not traditional woman. Um, so in that way, she has to sort of learn how to be bad yeah. and how to accept the fact that there may or may not be people who just aren't gonna like her if she makes that choice and pursues that life for herself. And she has to figure out if she's gonna be okay with that or not. Yeah, and they're all also great books, which is what I'm allowed to say and what you guys aren't, you, you weren't allowed to introduce your that books as being great. That would make us bad because we'd be too proud. Yeah, you're not allowed to be ambitious <laughs> or, or be brag. Humble. Yeah. <laughs> so, and of everything you could have written about Under the Sun, could you just briefly tell me like what drew you to this topic and why you decided to explore, you know, write a queer rom-com or write about gentrifying Brooklyn and why now? I guess, I don't know, we can go in the same order, yeah, I guess. Yeah, we can go yeah. in the same order. <laughs> um, so I started writing my book a couple years after I graduated from college um, and it was actually inspired by a conversation that I had with one of my very close friends who's in the audience right now. Um, and we were talking about toxic relationships and kind of this dynamic that we had seen a lot in college and just with our friends in you know, our, our late teenage years and early 20s. Um, and we were reminiscing about all these crazy kind of you know, stories we couldn't even believe that it happened because they were so ridiculous and so toxic. Um, and I, I decided that I wanted to write, to start writing about it because I didn't, feel like it had been written about um, in a very like super honest, prevalent way. Um, so I started writing this collection of short stories about based on a toxic relationship. And then I ultimately wrote enough of them that I felt like I could string it together and like I had this novel. 
Um, so that was the that was the inspiration. I, I mean, I think that that toxic relationships and unhealthy relationships where you know that it's wrong and you and yet you stay and you go back and you are willing to lie to yourself and to your friends and to those who are closest to you. I, I think that that's a really, unfortunately, a really common thing, common dynamic that happens um, in, you know, in our culture and when, especially when we're young and we're a little bit more vulnerable. So I, I wanted to write about it and I wanted to, to capture it and kind of turn it into this, this fictional story. Yeah, it's very relatable. Like you capture that like yeah. horrible feeling. You know that you're gonna go back, but you shouldn't. So. That's I've I've gotten a lot of feedback that it's very relatable. So I feel like beware. I, <laughs> yeah, beware. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't really read that novel without having flashbacks to my like one bad relationship. It was like you were there in the room. Were you hiding there? Like <laughs> maybe. Uh, so, <laughs> my book was the, the genesis of the story. I'm not a carrier of the BRCA1 gene mutation, but I was in Sydney at the end of 2016 on book two of my last book, The Regulars. And while I was there, I, of course, rushed to the doctor to get my, um, you know, check up because it's free there in Australia mm. and uh, so I just go to the doctor all the time when I'm there I love it uh, and I was getting my pap smear and my doctor was filling my breasts and she found a lump and she sort of said well you should go and get an ultrasound and my first instinct was like oh I, I can't possibly I just don't have time for that like the next day I had my first live tv appearance I was doing all these interviews uh, I was doing a presentation to all of Simon and Schuster and then I had my book launch that night and like in the same breath I realized like of course I have to do that like this is the most important thing that I have to do maybe ever and it was a terrible 24 hours and long story short it, the lump was benign and you know which sort of is end of story really like well just keep getting checked up and but really the fear of that and all of the spirals that you go down and I'm sure many people in this room have gone down some sort of like medical <laughs> like terrible rabbit hole um, of realizing like what would I do how would I handle this stay with me and when I came back to New York I had been, I'd known about preventative mastectomies because of course Angelina Jolie got a preventative mastectomy which really was the first time that the whole idea was brought into national consciousness. And at the time I didn't really understand it, it definitely seemed very shocking to me. But the more I thought about it and especially combined with my own experience, I realised what a incredibly brave, resi resilient decision that was for a woman, any woman at any age, to make about her own body. And what a feminist story that really was. And so that's kind of what kind of took me down the path of wanting to write about it in a way that was not just paying respects to the somber, serious nature of something like that, but that also was funny and sexy and warm, because that's kind of my thing, um, like feminist, sexy pop culture. and about something that really matters. And I thought it was an interesting challenge to try and write a sexy mastectomy novel. <laughs> and here we are. It's just what Angelina Jolie would have wanted. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, Angie. I, I, you, we should send it to her. I have tried. <laughs> it's very hard to send something to Angelina Jolie. They send you a an email by that says, thank you, we don't accept gifts. And I'm like, okay. Imagine what else people are sending to her. That's probably why. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, you met. <laughs> um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in Fort Greene, um, and then I went away for college. And when I came back, I was thinking a lot about gentrification uh, because I noticed the way that my neighborhood had changed, and I felt aware that I had a lot of access to the changes of the neighborhood because I'd spent this time away in an elite institution. So I knew how I liked my coffee at the fancy coffee shop. Um, so I had this access to a new Brooklyn, but felt very aware that many of the people that I loved in my family didn't have that same um, access. So I was really interested in this sort of in-between space, um, what one reader of the novel called the no man's land between gentrifier and gentrified. And so I invented Penelope Grand, and she's someone in that position. And I intended it to be a book about her 
homecoming and trying to figure out her place in her neighborhood and then also finding her way back into a creative practice. And I didn't expect it to be also about her relationship with her mother. Her mother was just sort of missing um, and this mysterious uh, kind of villainous figure. And so I started writing a little bit from her mother's point of view um, and she attempted to steal the novel away. Um, <laughs> and then I realized that a big heart of the book um, was what happened in the house on Halsey Street um, that not only is this emblem of an older Brooklyn but was also the site where a lot of transformative events happen in the history of this family. So I didn't intend to write a mother-daughter story um, but ultimately I did. Yes, I was telling Naima that I was walking around bed the other day and I could not stop thinking about your book because it really sticks with you, like all of the ideas you talk about, but it's also so vivid. So I imagined I would see Penelope. I hope she's doing better now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's, well, maybe we can talk about that. So yes, then, we will. Like, our, our desire for narratives of transformation um, and a character who makes a 180 and who is a champion. Um, and I think a lot about how behavior change is really difficult and yeah. full of setbacks. And sometimes the smallest shift is miraculous. Right. But how sometimes the imperatives of fiction or the market we want we want to see people make a 180. That's um, interesting that you say that yeah like for her like even a small thing is a triumph and that's kind of how it is for us too. So. Yeah. yeah. That's definitely how it is for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of always knew I wanted to write a queer book or a book that addressed issues of gender and sexuality actually long, long, long before I conceived of the idea um, of The Assistance, which ended up being my first novel. Um, the reason it, it, when Katie Met Cassidy wasn't my first novel is because I just couldn't quite get it right. I tried it with a lot of different structures, a lot of different formats, um, you know, tried it as a short story, tried it as this, it, and I just could never quite get it right, so I just kept putting it aside. Um, there were two things that I really had to figure out in order, it was like a code I had to crack to get this book right. And one of those was that I figured out that what I really wanted to do with this book was use a very traditional romantic comedy structure. Um, and, and just sort of riff on that, that traditional structure of meet, lose, get. Um, that, that straight audiences and readers have been getting all along um, without question and, and so, I knew that I wanted this story to just be a, a romance, a love story, and it wasn't going to be based in any tragedy. No one was going to get sick, no one was going to die, there wasn't going to be an identity-based misfortune, which is so often the case with books about the LGBTQ community. So that was one thing that I figured out. The other thing that I figured out after writing the book um, was the, it, the book is, is written um, in third person close alternating points of view. So we get Katie, and then we, it's, then we get Cassidy, then we get Katie, then we get Cassidy. So we're getting, it, we're getting the story from both of their points of view. Originally, my first conception of the novel, it was all from Katie's point of view, and it just wasn't working. Until I figured out that switch, um, that's when it really opened up for me. Yeah. Um, well, so yeah. your book came out in a good year because this has been like a big year for rom-coms. Rom-com <laughs> is back. You're bringing it back. Yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, let's let's hope book sales show that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it's good. It'll it soothes our soul. So one through line in all four of your books, and we spoke a little bit about this, Naima, is that they're all set in New York. So there are all these 20-something women, not really coming of age, but like coming into age is sort of how I think of this class of book. Um, and they, and so I wanted all of you to speak about how New York plays into the book too and why historically with shows like Sex and the City and Girls, it's always been a setting for women to like achieve some level of independence and to um, be able to come into themselves maybe without the pressures of a small town or without people watching them. And I don't know, maybe all of you can speak in conversation about how New York plays as a character in your books as well. Yeah, I definitely wanted to set the book in New York for a couple of reasons. One is when we usually have a story about a life changing piece of information or action with a character, there's sometimes a temptation to start the story with everything else kind of, everything's kind of gravy. Like there's, they've got the good relationship, the good housing situation, the good, everything's kind of, and then bam, everything changes. 
But because I wanted to write about a young woman in her 20s in New York, it just wouldn't be realistic. Like, there is no... No one in this room would be like, I've got it all figured out, and honestly, I'm cool. Like, (laughs) it's just like... Especially in your 20s, like, everything is in flux. You're working out who you are, where you want to work, what sort of work you want to do, who you want to be, who you want to date, how you want to live. Like, everything is up for debate. And I thought it would be interesting to start a character like that and then give her this life-changing, life-changing action that would then sort of change everything around her. So my character is from a small town and another sort of factor, the way in which New York works is a great foil for her is that she's from a small town and she's not really in um, control. Like she's, a, she's not a sexually empowered woman. She's, her mother passed away when she was very young. She doesn't have a lot of... And she has a sort of acrimonious relationship with her sister. So she doesn't have a lot of female role models who ever sort of... She, that she grew up with uh, understanding that your body is something that can be pleasurable for you, that you are in charge of. And so she doesn't sort of see her body as like a, a, a thing that she can... that she can kind of look after and that she can spoil and indulge in. And... I thought it would be interesting to have her in New York because everyone assumes that if you're in New York and working in the fashion world, then you sort of have it all together. But she's like secretly doesn't have that together. When she gets the diagnosis, she confesses to her friends like she's never really had a boyfriend in New York. She does. She usually fakes orgasms when she has sex. Like she's never done a lot of things they've done. And now she has to create and. Of course, the book is called The Bucket List, and she creates a boob bucket list of all the things she wants to do with and for her boobs before possible surgery. Yeah. And um, it's sort of complicated by being in New York because her life there is very complicated. She's got two jobs. She works for a trend forecaster. She's on the founding team of an app, which, again, is very New York. Like, everyone's got an app idea and I know I'm friends with like lots of entrepreneurs and they're everyone's kind of in that startup world so for me like New York was definitely a great place to put this character who had to make this complicated decision in an already complicated life about something as complicated as your body and sex and what you're going to do in if you were to have that diagnosis so that's how that's how I sort of approach New York what about you guys obviously your book is very specifically about a changing New York a new New York yeah well my book it's interesting because both of the women have tried to escape New York so at the beginning of the book Penelope's living in Pittsburgh and her mother's in the Dominican Republic and part of what I was trying to do there was sort of trouble this idea um, of New York as a place where you accomplish yourself actualization um, and you feel empowered and connected. Um, so for Mireya, who's an immigrant, who's primarily a Spanish speaker, um, and she felt very out of place in bed so was in a community of people of color, but felt alienated from the African-American and West Indian community that she found herself in, um, but also felt disconnected from the people who she worked for in New York. She cleaned houses for chiefly white families in New York. So it's a place where she feels like her best life is elsewhere, and she has the means to go, and she does, and lives in an expat community in the Dominican Republic. And then for Penelope, too, who's a part of an art scene in New York, or rather, she would like to be, but isn't, she also feels sort of disconnected from an art scene that seems to be populated with her classmates from RISD, who have somebody bankrolling their lives and their rent um, while she's in this attic apartment in Bed-Stuy trying to sketch. Um, And so the book has a lot of passages about Brooklyn that I think seem like a love letter to Brooklyn. But um, in terms of whether New York is a place where um, coming into being is facilitated or affordable um, or smooth, I think it's something the book really tries to question. Yeah. No, it definitely does that. Um, yeah, New York is like a hard place in all four books in one way or another, whether it's through isolation or through not really like knowing where you stand, but it plays in. And then also going back to something Georgia was talking about. So New York is one big through line. The age of the characters is a through line between all your books, but so sex. So can maybe all of you talk about like the, like why you chose to write sexy books and how like the character sexuality might, um, is, is part of their journey too. And um, yeah, why it's like an essential part of the book. And also why readers are prudish. I, you were talking about this before. I didn't really know that was a thing, but apparently it is. Yeah, I mean, 
there's definitely a lot of sex and tell me lies. But, and it's interesting because, you know, it can be like uncomfortable for some people to, to read that, especially if it's like my parents' friends or like <laughs> my, my boyfriend's parents or like stuff like that. But what I've really thought about a lot since, since I've, since the book has come out, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but I think that sex is just part of the story sometimes. Like, it, I wasn't even really trying to write about sex. I wasn't trying to have, like, a lot of sex scenes in my book, but this, the, rela the central relationship in my book is based on lust. It's really, you know, it's this, it's this obsessive, kind of addictive relationship where um, Lucy, the protagonist, thinks that something is re thinks that it's real when in reality, what she's feeling, a lot of what she's feeling, is just lust and just chemistry and attraction. So, it was really critical for me to write about sex and write about the way she was thinking about the sex she was having in the book because, you know, I think when when you are in involved in a in a toxic unhealthy relationship like that and like I think sex can get in the way so for me that was just a part of a part of the story and a part of her a part of her attraction to to this relationship yeah um but I don't know if you feel this way about like Lacey or it was kind of similar yeah I mean I definitely think that sex shows you a lot about a character who who they have sex with like when they have sex why they have sex how they feel about themselves when they're having sex I mean it's essentially this it's similar to a lot of other choices that we make the food that we eat like all of the clothes that we wear they all tell us so much about ourselves and about a character and it is curious to me at the amount of you know, one star Goodreads reviews that I'll get with people being like, this book is uh, like, ha essentially, to paraphrase, like too much sex in it. Uh, yeah. Which is always, and it really doesn't have like, and it's not, like, I would tell you if it was a Fifty Shades, like, don't worry. <laughs> it's like, it's not a Fifty Shades. And it's not, um, there's, it's one, not, there's no, one sort I mean, of Fifty Shades. Which, which no, no shade, Fifty Shades, <laughs> but like, I read that book and I actually really enjoyed it. But like, that's another story. Um, uh, it's like, it's, still one of those things which seems like a real hot button issue like you're talking about like five percent of the book being sex scenes and that coloring to the point that with this book because my last book had sex scenes as well i made my publicist put in like the um net galley page which is where you get advanced copies that this book has sex scenes like i basically gave it an r rating where it's like <laughs> if you were just offended by sex like don't give me a one-star review for my like you know five or so sexy scenes in it um <laughs> But it, like, in a way, this book had to have sex in it because it's about someone thinking of losing their breasts and a young woman who isn't yet sort of really thinking about, it, even though the question of kids does come up, like it's much more about like, how do I relate to my body? Like, how, am I in control of my body? Is this something that I feel that I am exactly where I want to be? And I was not th there in my mid-20s at all. Like, I was definitely still figuring out like my own sexuality and like a, a lot of things to do with my body. So I think that the book had to have sex scenes in order to tell the story. And I think that's true of both of your stories as well. Like yeah. the sex scenes shows us so much about the characters. Oh yeah, I, um, I mean there had to be sex in my book um, or who would read it. Uh, <laughs> but one of the greatest compliments I've ever received um, on my writing uh, came a little bit before um, when Katie Mac Cassidy came out and I was at this New York literary party and a very well-read um, young woman who's you know sort of prominent in the New York book world came over to me and said, oh my God, Camille, um, I've been reading when Katie Mac Cassidy and now I am just horny all the time. <laughs> and she's straight and married, um, which was like perfect. Like that's exactly what my intention was with this book. Um, <laughs> Because I wanted it to be a book that wasn't just for queer readers and wasn't just for straight readers, but it could work for anyone. Um, and it was not just a book about love, um, but it was also a book about figuring out your desire and what satisfies you. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that's... Because I think that is just more complicated than we give it credit for. I think there's this idea of we 
And I mean, desire really for who we want to be with and also who we are and the kind of relationship we want to be in. There's no real education for that apart from very informal educations with your friends, your girlfriends, like television, the movies. And it's such a huge thing and it defines so much the quality of your life, the kind of relationships that you have and the way that you interact yeah. in a relationship. There's very little education about that. And I do think that books really are teachers. I mean, your book is a great what not to do. <laughs> like it's yes. one big <laughs> not what to do, right? Yes. yes. I think I've, I've talked to people who are like, like, I want my daughter to read this book before she goes to college. <laughs> like, it's like a, a warning manual. So. No, really. How to spot a sociopath in the wild. That's yeah. useful. Exactly. I also think we should mention, since this is about bad women, that, um, you know, as girls and women, we aren't socialized to put our sexual desire at the forefront. Um, you know, the whole idea of, of all of these women who don't orgasm when they have sex is because they're so focused on their male partner. Um, and they don't put their needs first. And it, we, we just haven't, we haven't learned um, to think of sex that way in this country. Um, even if we were lucky enough to grow up in a state that had actual sex ed, we still didn't learn it um, that way. And there, there's a book called um, Come As You Are by Emily Nagasaki, I think is her name. Yeah. What's the name? Nagoski, thank you. Um, fantastic nonfiction book, um, and it makes great points about how um, sex is treated very differently in other countries, like for example in Scandinavia, where it's just a completely different situation, and they have so they have such a better sex culture, and, and um, there's less rape, and there's less confusion in that gray area of what is rape and what isn't, you know. Um, and they, they learn to ask for what they want. They learn to identify their needs and then be able to say what their needs are, which is something that I think women especially um, have a lot of trouble doing, regardless of their sexuality. If only we could all move to Scandinavia. I think of that <laughs> regularly, transplant there. Um, I'd miss the sun. But so something you all touched on is sort of what we can learn from literature. And I know I've learned so much from women characters that I've read. Most of the time, though, I'm drawn to ones that aren't perfect, that are flawed. Like, I would take a Elizabeth Bennet over a Jane Bennet um, any day. I know that's controversial. But um, <laughs> so can maybe all of you tell me who your favorite bad women in literature are and maybe tell me why, like, books are a place where women are allowed to show off their flaws in a way that we don't really do in regular life where we're being judged by the outside world all the time. Like there's, a, there's room for interiority that we can learn from. I'm trying to think of who my favorite bad woman is. Um, Joe fucking March. Joe March, she's a badass. Yes, Total totally. March. Uh, was extremely formative for me. I wish that she just ended up with a woman at the end, but. Totally, <laughs> yeah. But aside from that, perfect, perfect example. Um, Give her a couple years. Yeah. <laughs> character Esh uh, in Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. So Esh is 14 or 15. She's pregnant. Um, she's poor. She's black. Um, she lives in the South. Um, she's also really into Greek mythology um, and loves her brothers and is really intrigued by the dog China, a pit bull that lives on her family's property. Um, and she's a really interesting character because although she's not particularly um, well-educated, the book lays out all of the richness of her mind, um, which is something that the book, that novels can do and literature can do, can show us all of the things that exist inside of someone. Um, and she's also someone who, a lot of the facts of her life are so often distorted in media narratives or other narratives that we might find. There's a great scene in Salvage the Bones where Esh and her brothers steal something from a neighbor's house. They need some medicine to save the life of their dog and they're shot at. Um, and it's such a tremendous difference what it feels like to be with Esh in that moment when she and her brothers are running away with this life-saving medicine for their dog um, versus what that might be sort of reduced to a headline. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of it also is just the amount of space and attention that a book demands. Um, and that book demands that you spend a lot of time with Esh and the facts of her life um, and the richness of her mind. I think that that's really powerful. Right. Yeah. People can't be reduced to a sentence or a headline yeah. or bad or, or good. Yeah. Right. They're they more can, than that. 
write a one-star review yeah. um, <laughs> or put the book down or decide not to pick it up in the first place. But right. once you're in it, you're in it. Yeah. I really liked um, Postcards from the Edge, which was the book that Carrie Fisher oh, yeah. wrote that the movie was then based on. I loved Carrie, I loved Carrie Fisher. And she was a bad woman in so many ways. She was extremely transgressive and the kind of writing that she did in the performance that she made and sort of especially as she was older. And the main character, Suzanne, is a character who is defined by addiction, really addiction to drugs and alcohol, addiction to fame. And it was really Carrie working through a lot of her own sort of issues, which she did a lot of in her um, one woman plays that she wrote but it's a very if you like um, kind of like seedy underbelly of Hollywood sort of stories uh, and it's a bit of a throwback I think it was late 80s or maybe the early 90s and uh, that's a great she's a great bad woman in that book yeah um, this past year I read The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna and I immediately think of oh, when you say, when you asked your question of um, Isabel, who's the younger sister of, um, of the two sisters in the book. And she, I, I love The Nightingale because it kind of shows this other side of World War II. It shows the women's war. And Isabel is um, living in France and she wants nothing more than to get involved in the war and to fight in the war somehow. And she, Everyone tells her not to, her family tells her not to, and she is really stubborn and just knows what she wants and goes for it. And she just sort of de defies everybody's um, expectations and goes against them and in this way that makes her a bad woman. Um, but ultimately, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers for the book, but she goes and, and really empowers herself and follows her heart. And you know, I think that that's, I think when a woman in literature really follows her heart, um, it's not always, you know, it sometimes comes with a price and it, it sometimes makes them out to be a bad or flawed woman, but it's, you know, that's really, it can be a magical, a magical yeah. experience. Not to, to read about. And I'm going to plug Isabel's sister in the book, who starts off as a like very good girl, but she also becomes pretty bad by the end, too. Viv Vivian. Yeah, Vivian. Vian. Oh, yes. I forget her name. Yeah, I just Vian. remember that book so much. It's going to be a movie. It's very good. Yes, it's so good. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So good. Okay. And then I, since there were a lot of writers in the room, I always find this question to be helpful. Um, could you like tell me what your writing routine is when you wake up in the morning? Like, How do you... How do you approach writing a book every day? And how, how'd you guys get this book done, essentially, is what I want to know. I think that's what everyone who wants to write a book wants to know. How'd you do it? <laughs> well, and I'm working on a few different projects right now because my uh, first book is in development for a TV show and I also run a storytelling night. So like, I don't generally have like a set day. But if I did have an ideal writing day, it would be I use a writing program called Scrivener, which is a great, uh, it's a better software tool than Microsoft Word. It's just better to organize large amounts of words, like for long form projects, be it fiction or nonfiction. And it's um, not that expensive. I think that if you do want to write a novel or a nonfiction um, book, it's definitely worth the investment. It's like $45. And I also use an app called Freedom, which turns off the internet. Essential, wow. essential. Radical. Uh, whether you just turn off a few websites that you know you're totally addicted to, uh, definitely turn your phone off, put it in the other room. But removing distractions is key. Uh, for me, like an ideal writing day would be three blocks of two hours. So generally before lunch, after lunch, and then just before the evening. I don't really like writing early morning or late nights. I just prefer to write in the day. And part of what really works for me is Definitely treating writing like a job, and it is my job now, but even before it was my job, less of a hobby of like something I might do the next day if I felt like it. Because if that happens, you will never write because it's mostly, when, certainly when you start, it's not very fun. Like it's not enjoyable at all. So you really have to kind of get through the slog of it and just write anything and just start to kind of like beat it out in a way to get a, to get a first draft. And also just like the night before you have a writing day or writing session, like really mentally commit to that. Like, so you just sort of know how it's gonna happen. Again, if it's like 
Maybe I'll try and get some pages done tomorrow, but I've also got a lot on, so it's, it's, it won't happen. It's not going to happen because it's work and it sucks. So <laughs> you just have to know, like, I'm definitely waking up at 7 a.m. I'm going to get my coffee. I'm going to be at the computer from 7.15 to 8.15 before I go into work. I'm turning the internet off. Like, I'm going to be sitting there, like, literally visualize how it's going to happen. And there is this part of your brain that will just reset into like, well, that's going to happen now rather than maybe it'll happen. It's so much about just getting your butt in the chair and just getting through it, like word by word, bird by bird as the oh, famous yes. book The goes. goddess and the mod. Yeah, I think you should buy that book, yes, bird by bird. <laughs> that's the best book ever. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What about you guys? What I agree. You I think I'm a firm believer in muscle memory. Um, so I think regardless of how much time, free time you have to write, you know, assuming every, most of you probably have day jobs, um, so you probably can't just write, you know, for your seven hours a day or whatever. Um, but that doesn't matter. What's most impo important is that you you set a time to write, and it's really, really helpful if you do it at the same time, either every day or every week, um, and for the set amount of time. So I think three hours, two hours works for you. I think I think three-hour chunks are, work best for me. Anything beyond that. I sort of get a return on my investment, on my energy. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's really good to think of it as a practice. Like if you, if you practice yoga or if you are training for a marathon, um, you can really sort of train your body and your brain to just kind of know, oh, okay, now it's the moment when I do this. And, and, and so much of it then just becomes automatic that you almost don't even need to think about yeah. it. Yeah, Carla, I know you're a yoga teacher. Is there any like overlap between the art of yoga and the art of novel writing? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that um, I actually wrote an article about this for Yoga Journal like before, I think last year before my book came out. Um, but yoga, yoga really, I, I teach yoga and I practice for a long time and it, it really allows me to like clear my head and create space in my mind um, to let inspiration and creativity kind of arise and I think that you know for for writing it's similar um, like what Georgia was saying you want to go into it with a really clear mind so that you can just kind of let yourself experience it without you know without thinking about it too hard like when I when I go to write I like to just make sure that my desk is clean and that I have water and coffee and I should start turning off the internet. I really should. Um, but just this, this big idea of yoga and like of clearing space and, and holding space also translates really well to writing. Um, so that's been helpful for me. And also whenever, I, whenever I'm feeling scatterbrained or a little crazy, which if you decide to write a book, that will happen. Um, I go to yoga and just, it, it definitely helps me most of the time get centered and come back down to earth and feel a little bit more grounded so that it, when I go back to my desk, um, I feel like I'm, I have a clean slate. But I, I agree with what both of you or everyone was saying. Like it's, it's definitely, writing a book is, if you have a full-time job, it's, it's obviously hard and you have to really prioritize um, when you're going to write and you have to like what I like to do is to actually put writing time into my schedule so I'll say okay I'm doing this from I'm doing this in the afternoon I'm going to I'm going to block out 8 to 1 o'clock or whatever it is to write and you stick to it and you should definitely read by bird by bird because it goes a little bit more into the process and you know what happens when you actually sit down at the computer um but like it's like a job you have to show up and you have to put in the time and you don't have to write 5000 words every day but i think just m making it more of like a like what you were saying Camille muscle memory and and getting into a routine and and a habit um and kind of just taking it on step by step bird by bird like it'll it'll add up to something bigger, um, but you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And every day is not going to be a dream. Yeah. Naima, I want to yeah. know what your advice is, and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah. I, I've found in my own practice as a writer that time has certainly been a limiting factor in having other commitments and different jobs and hustles. But I also find that they're often emotional or 
psychological barriers to the work too, um, whether that's because the project is dredging something up that's difficult to confront, or um, just finding the amount of confidence and guts that it takes to sit in a chair and work on something that there are no immediate rewards. And I was talking to a friend today who said writing a novel is like working in a vacuum of validation because there's no one there who's like, good job. Um, you're doing great. It's all going to work out. Um, and so I, I find um, that for me, in order to keep going, um, it's really helpful to do, um, to have a clear mind, as you said, and to find different ways to take care of myself emotionally so that I can do the work. Um, so that might be more calls with friends about my doubts and what's troubling me about a project. Um, therapy, always therapy. Um, and just a lot of self-care. And I've often found that you know if I haven't put in that work of sort of taking care of myself emotionally, I might be facing an hour or two um, where nothing gets done or things get done, but I can't recognize the accomplishment of it. So for me, it's always been sort of a function of time, but also how, how am I doing? How are, yeah. the better I'm doing, the more I'm able to accomplish um, in terms of my writing life. Yeah, and then maybe one day you'll end up here talking about your books at the Strand. <laughs> I think also uh, people think that like when, you, when you're a writer, people think that means that your schedule is totally free. Like I have friends who will be like, oh, you're, you're not doing anything tomorrow. Like, let's hang out. Like, I'm going to come over. And I'm like, just because I'm not going to an office, like, it doesn't mean that I can hang out. You know, and you have to kind of, I think you have to really, like, put down those barriers into your schedule so that, like, you, you treat it, like Georgia was saying, like it's your job. Yeah, it is your job. I know you guys aren't slackers. Is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although you can wake up where, whenever you want, so I'm jealous of that. But um, anyway, thank you all for talking. Can, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring you. Oh, sorry. Right in, there's like, a microphone. This is a tech-savvy place. So I've heard often that writers have certain themes that they return to. So even though every book looks different, the structure might be different, the time period is different, do you each think that you have a overarching theme in all of your writing or all of your fiction? One that I not consciously write about but more gets pointed out to me is female bodies and how they define us but don't limit us. I'm very interested in the way in which, um, in how, how we are as women, especially as defined through our bodies and faces. I wrote about beauty in my last book. And I think that's because it's really interesting to me that we hold these two ideas in our hands as women. And one is that we are in charge of our bodies. Obviously, like, we control how they move. We, we decide how to dress them. We decide how to feed them. But we also know that our bodies, there is a degree to which the construction of how our bodies are understood is, like, out of our hands. Um, and I, I was away this weekend with um, staying upstate with some friends who had little kids and one of the girls was like six years old and she wanted to draw her favorite superhero who was Poison Ivy, who's a villain, but whatever. And um, so she's like, let's it's look a up woman. a picture of Poison <laughs> Ivy for you. To, and then it was me to draw for her. She's like, I'm gonna draw it. And then she's like, you draw it. And I'm like, okay, I'm learning how to hang out with kids. And, um, <laughs> and then we looked at all these pictures. I put in like Poison Ivy and all of the pictures that came up were of course of these like massive boobed, tiny, wasted women that this six-year-old and I are scrolling through. And she, thank God, like pointed to the one who looked most like a little girl, like who was the little girl character. But like even at that young age, like she's understanding and filtering out these unrealistic images of women as she is like drawing her favorite sort of superheroes. And I don't think that that process like just basically never stops. Like we are constantly understanding and filtering out these images, but I think what's really interesting right now is the degree to which we also, in the kind of social media culture, is we keep perpetuating these images of ourselves. Like we spend a lot of time taking pictures of ourselves and making them look pretty and then putting them out there. So like we are now, it's not like a passive experience, which I think it used to be a little more passive of like seeing images on like billboards and TV screens. Like now we are involved with the production of ourselves and I just find that really interesting. And um, it's just something that we're, it's a very complex idea and that we're 
we're all sort of constantly working through. So that's a theme that I, I keep returning to. What about you guys? What comes up for you? I'm working on my second book, and I have another book project um, as well. And they're all really similar thematically, actually. So um, I tend to write about place and how it shapes people, although I'm the other two projects are not set in New York. Um, and the kinds of tensions that come up when people are living in close proximity to each other and their differences that exist across lines of class and race. Um, I'm also really interested in the inner lives of women um, and memory and how the past is always pressing in on us in the present. And so that tends to be true across all of those projects. Yeah. I am. Um, I don't think I have a thematic. I've only. I mean, aside from ghostwriting, I've only published two novels. Um, but I think both of my books, in a way, are sort of um, secretly socially conscious. Um, like I wanted my first book called The Assistants um, is about a group of young women assistants who use their billionaire media moguls boss uh, use their billionaire media mogul boss's expense account to pay off their student loan debt. And so what I really wanted to do was write about student loan debt, the crisis of our generation, and the gender wage gap, and you know all, all of these sort of issues. But I, I knew that I needed to addr address that story in a, in a really slick, fun package. So people, you know, there were, someone actually once described the assistance as um, a socially conscious novel in chiclet clothing. And I think in a way, when Katie McCassidy is similar um, in that I knew I wanted to address issues of gender and sexuality and, and all of these things, but I, I needed to, I, I, I put it in a slick, you know, pink covered package of, of, of rom-com, Nora Ephron-like rom-com. Um, so I think, I think I'm sort of um, Trojan horsing my politics into really, really fun, entertaining, slick stories. Uh, but now the secret's out, That's so it's not, it's not gonna work a third time. <laughs> That is a good strategy. Um, Carol, are there any themes you come back to? Um, well, Tell Me Lies is my first book, so I'll probably have a better answer for you, hopefully in like a year. But um, I, one thing I've noticed as I've been working on my second book is that I, I keep going back to dysfunctional relationships. Um, I'm not sure what that says about me, <laughs> but I'm very interested in, um, in dysfunctional relationships. Um, dysfunctional friendships or love relationships. And I also have noticed that I, I keep going back to this mother-daughter theme, which is a big, a big theme and a big relationship in Tell Me Lies. And I'm kind of going back to it again. And again, I don't know what that means, but I, I think it's a very interesting relationship and a, a beautiful one. So, um, yeah. but stay tuned. Yeah, we didn't really touch on it, but mother-daughter relationships all are in your books too. So it's a whole other can of worms. Um, so are there any, any other questions from the audience? Hello, hi. I write quite a bit of narrative nonfiction and a lot of my work revolves around research. So I'm wondering like for your book about Brooklyn or about breast cancer, how much of your time goes into research and I sometimes feel bogged down by like facts and information and how to turn that into like something in a pretty pink dress. And so I'm just wondering a little bit about how you sift through um, factual information and history and, and medical or whatever and, and turn that into like a lovely story. Yeah, we were just talking about that, George and I were talking, but yeah, you can start, yeah. Naima. Um, I didn't do very much research for Halsey Street. I read two books about gentrification, um, and they didn't show up very much um, in the actual novel. But I think what helps me more is sort of having a kind of lens that I'm wearing when I'm working on something where I'm just absorbing everything I overhear people say about gentrification. Um, it's a lens I have when I'm watching films or going to a photography exhibit. So it's more like I'm on this different kind of setting and I'm absorbing. And I was doing that also in thinking about motherhood as well, sort of like picking up information everywhere. Um, and in some ways, I found that to be more generative for me than the books that I read. Um, and that was maybe more of like a panic about book tour and what if people ask me questions and I'm not an expert. Yeah. 
I did a lot of research for this book because it's not my story. And um, it's not like a story of like a close friend of mine. So I, uh, I like to research. I read a lot. Obviously, I read a lot of memoirs. Um, I read a lot of essays online. I like to speak to people to do research. That's my kind of preferred way of learning about something that I don't know about. So that was like finding subjects. And it really was quite a long... I, I didn't have a lot of time with this book because we, um, I had a deadline, which is also another good thing to give yourself if you are researching because you can just endlessly research because A, it's fun, and B, it means you don't have to write. <laughs> so uh, you could just research for years and never start writing. So I sort of had like a basic time frame of how much I would be full-time researching for and then when I would be starting. And it was... And then the research sort of keeps going on because I made contacts and then would return to them um, as I started to get pages out and they would read scenes. But I will say that the task of entering into something as emotionally charged as a... It, the community is called pre-vivors because you get a surgery to survive, so you're like a pre-viver, um, was really definitely intimidating at, at first. I was like, what the fuck have I got myself into here? Like, I'm, you know, an outsider in this world that exists to support those who are in it. Like, there's not a lot of outsiders in it. But I just, you know, I had my... I explained clearly what I was there for and that I also had had a book published so I would keep pointing at being like, see, I'm actually a real writer. But um, uh, I think that mostly I, you will find that most people are really open to speaking with you and if you are just interested and open and curious and you're really there to learn about someone else's life, you will be surprised the lounge rooms and kitchens that you end up with, like with, you know, a tape recorder on. And it's really fascinating. Like, I would definitely encourage you if you are writing and there is an element to which a person's experience is outside of your own, to send a cold email, like ask for an introduction, um, because it's really enriching. And it wasn't just for, I obviously, I talked with women who had had mastectomies, who had the BRCA gene, but hadn't had mastectomies with plastic surgeons, with genetic counsellors, like everyone in that world. And then my book also had a storyline to do with startups, so I had like a startup contact. And you just sort of have your, I just have like this Rolodex of professionals that I call up if I need some information. But certainly I would say give yourself a deadline. Like just sort of say like, I'm gonna research for like one month, six months, one year, whatever it is, and then put it aside and trust that your subconscious is going to do the work of churning through things and don't feel like you have to uh, like honour every single thing you've read because you are writing something different. It has to be true, it can't be made up, but you don't need to like... I didn't use every single piece of information that I you know, got in the writing process and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, the research definitely shows through in your book. All right, let's do one more question, if anyone has. Yeah. little piece of an idea and my parents would constantly hear from my teachers like she's so good at this why doesn't she and it, then the wheels kind of started turning for me but now that I've kind of started to formulate a story and an idea I find myself constantly changing and it kind of draws out the finish line for me which is fine because I don't want to rush through something but have you guys had that issue where you go to work towards what you think you want to write about or like a topic you think you want or like a kind of a narrative you want to run with and then all of a sudden you're like oh god I don't want to do this this doesn't sound as good as I thought it was and then you constantly second guess that like how do you kind of overcome that second guessing or like that changing I guess I don't know deadline and that change the constant change in thinking what you want and then all of a sudden it's not what you want and like how do you kind of not do that I guess <laughs> if that makes no, sense that's such a really wordy question but I yeah. think if I, I'm going to jump in on this um, as someone who has dozens of stories and novels that didn't go anywhere for years and years and years until I finally found my voice. Um, and if anyone had told me when I was, you know, 20 years old and thinking, you know, I'm going to write the great American novel. Like if anyone told me that it would be how many years it would actually be before my first book was published, it would have broken my heart. Like, I don't know if I could have done it. But, but what you're describing um, is process. Like, 
this is your process. This is how, the thing about writing is, is you're learning how to write. There's really no other way to learn how to write than to just do it, trial and error. And so my advice to you would be, whatever it is you're working on that you're passionate about, finish it. Get to the end of it. It doesn't matter what happens with it. It doesn't matter if it then goes into the drawer and that talk, you, you worked out things you needed to work out and, and lessons that you needed to learn for the next thing. And that's not a failure. That's how every writer becomes a writer. So you just have to be patient and you have to be relentless. Um, and you have to believe in yourself long before you get outside validation. Because once you get the outside validation, it's easy. You know, once you score your agent, you're like, okay, I can do this. Once you got your, once you sold your first book, okay, I can do this. The hard part is those years and years where you're struggling, where maybe your family's not super supportive. Maybe I had student loan debt. You know, you, you're you're doing this, and, and and you know, years go by, and people are like, so how's that book you're working on? You know, it's been like ten years. You know, and you start to feel like garbage. You feel, am I am I a loser? Am I pathetic? Like, what's you know? And, and then all of a sudden it happens, and, and you'll realize that it happened at exactly the right moment. That those things that you were working on, or the, the, the form that those stories were taking, that didn't make it to see the light of day, they weren't supposed to. Um, because you're gonna, find, you're, gonna, you're gonna know how to tell that story better by the time it clicks into place and, and sees the light of day, you have to trust that the process is gonna take care of you, and that's gonna happen at the right moment. Yeah, that is some Yoda-like writing wisdom. <laughs> Trust yeah. the process. I mean, I don't know how to do yoga, but yes. That was no, very I said Yoda. Yoda, oh Yoda. Oh, to, Yoda. To Yoda. oh that the process. Um, yes. Trust. Yoda. Yes. I know how to do Yoda. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, Anne Lamott in her book, in her writing book, um, Bird by Bird, she has this chapter called "Shitty First Drafts," and it's it's basically like what Camille was saying: how you just have to get through it and like write till the end like that's a lot like most I would say 99.9% .9 of first drafts are going to be shitty and like that's just the reality for all writers even though you see this like pretty packaged book with a pretty cover and think like that that just magically came out of somebody like it didn't you know like you're, you're going to have to write a bunch of crap and then go back and kind of weed through it and that's when you in this chapter of her book, Anne Lamott talks about like going back through your shitty first drafts and finding the gold in it. And maybe it's only like one sentence or maybe it's a paragraph um, of a chapter or something. But there's, you know, there'll be something that you go back and find that you're like, okay, that is exactly like what I wanted to capture. That's it. And then, you know, that's, that's why you edit. That's why you revise. And when you revise, like you you take what was good about your first draft and you can just, the rest can go out the window, like nobody ever has to know. Um, so I think that definitely, like that is totally process. Um, no writer would want anyone, I don't think would want anyone in the world to see their first draft of a book. So um, that, I think it's very, very natural. Yeah. There's hope and then, yeah. you, and then you'll be here. Well, this was fun. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you guys for Thank showing you. up. Thanks for being here.